with me, I have Beth O'Hara, who is a functional naturopath and a functional genetic analyst. She has a doctorate in naturopathy, specializing in functional naturopathic approaches and a master's in marriage and family therapy. She has over 10 years of experience working with hundreds of clients with mast cell activation syndrome, mold toxicity, and related conditions. And she has been through this journey herself, going from bedridden in excruciating pain and unable to function to living a full and joyful life by addressing the underlying root causes. Her mission today is to empower those struggling with sensitivities and significant chronic illnesses to re reclaim their own full potential through individualized precision approaches. Thank you so much for joining us, Beth. Oh, it's great to be here. I'm excited. And I think a lot of people in the community you have are going to find some light bulbs go off with this conversation because there's a, there's a big link with what we're going to talk about in thyroid issues. Yeah, I agree. And I'm excited as well. And, you know, as I said in the in the bio, you've had a significant health journey yourself, and, and that's what got you into this field. And so you can can you share some of that journey with us? Sure. It, I find that it's a journey that a lot of people in the chronically ill population can relate to. And I, I like to start there because it gives people hope. So I started developing health issues when I was uh, a child. I was about eight or nine when I started having some strange symptoms. We had moved to the country into an old farmhouse. And I'm in my 40s now. So this was a few decades ago. Nobody knew anything about mold or Lyme back then. It's even not talked about enough now, but back then it really wasn't on the radar. And looking back, the farmhouse had quite a bit of mold. So I developed mold toxicity at a young age. We were in the country. We played outside. We were bitten by ticks. I thought we were having a Laura Ingalls Wilder kind of adventure, but I, I didn't have the stamina that my friends had. I couldn't keep up in sports. I didn't have coordination. And then I was kicked in the head by a horse when I was nine, had a traumatic brain injury. I started, I had severe anxiety. I then was in a car accident when I was 16 and had severe fatigue. I just couldn't seem to come back from that. And I would whip myself every morning just to get out of bed, to get to school on time. I did keep moving forward and somehow um, I was very driven. I was very driven to go to medical school and that was the only thing I wanted to do. I had no backup plan. I had actually just to illustrate how important this was for me, for my birthday, all I wanted was a copies of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> was all I cared about. And I was the weird little kid that was running through the woods, finding, you know, bleach piles of of, of bones and try and put the skeleton back together. And this was my super interest, my passion. And I went to college. I still was struggling with fatigue. I was starting to develop some brain fog. The anxiety was severe. And my junior year in college, I moved into a duplex that was 150 years old. It smelled musty in the basement. Again, I didn't know about mold but my health really crashed and I'd had, I worked my, just worked my rear off and I'd had multiple offers, scholarship offers to medical school and I had to turn them all down. So instead of getting to go pursue my dreams, I became this chronically ill person. And by the time I graduated, I barely finished my bachelor's out and went from this high performing, I was working three jobs. I was te teaching at a vocational school. I was doing independent study research, taking graduate school classes, to taking the minimal number of credits to, to graduate. And nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. I had joint pain, I had brain fog, I had severe fatigue, I had blood sugar crashes to where I had to eat every two hours. And just to go out of the house, I had to bring a snack. And this just continued to accelerate. So by the time I was in my later 20s, I had to walk with a cane and I wasn't even really walking. I was barely hobbling. The joint pain was like walking with ground glass stuck inside my knees and my toes, my fingers. So I was misdiagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, treatments didn't help because that wasn't the right diagnosis. And many practitioners, I, if nothing else, I was persistent in trying to find help. And I exhausted traditional medicine, exhausted holistic. I did homeopathy, his shamanic work. I did anything I could do. I did therapy to clear any kind of emotional pieces. And uh, I was the most complex case that 
all the practitioners I'd seen had ever worked with. And they would tell me that I've never met anybody as complex as you. I became extremely sensitive. I couldn't tolerate any medications, no supplements. I was having paradoxical reactions to everything I tried. And uh, people, practitioners started telling me I was crazy and that it was in my head, that I wanted to be sick, that I was getting something out of being sick, which was the farthest from the truth. But I share that part because that's also a common story. And I hear it every week in my clinic. I know you hear it all the time. Fast forward, I had seen about 75 practitioners. I just kept spiraling downward till um, I had a whole year I was bedridden and could barely function. It was a good day if I could get the dishwasher unloaded and then I couldn't get it loaded. That was too much. But I did land on first histamine intolerance. I had itching head to toe. I had all kinds of GI issues sleep disturbances. I didn't sleep for four years. And um, practitioners told me you can't go more than two weeks without sleep. That's not true. You can go years without sleeping. Then I learned about this thing called mast cell activation syndrome. And this was when I was still in the theoretical phases. And this is fairly new on the scene of traditional medicine, but there have been studies about this and theories about this for a few decades, really case studies coming around 2000 theorized around um, late 1980s, early 1990s. And when I saw that description, I said, oh my gosh, everything makes sense. So my GI symptoms, my skin symptoms, my brain fog, my fatigue, my anxiety, this horrific insomnia, all of this is connected, the bladder pain, everything that I was dealing with. And I had symptoms in every system, I was pretty severe. Learning about that started shifting my mindset of what we were looking at. And I realized we weren't chasing all of these separate things. This is all connected. And then the next question was, well, why? Why are these mast cells dysregulated? That's when I peeled back. We, we knew I had Lyme and Bartonella and Babesia, but I couldn't treat it. Then we realized I had mold toxicity. And that brought this huge light bulb to what was going on, why I had the nervous system dysregulation, why I was so sensitive. That allowed me to start to unravel what's happening. And unfortunately, I had this pre-med background. So every moment my brain would work, I was studying, I was pulling things out, I was chasing down anything that could help, starting putting pieces together. And eventually I did get my brain back. I got my life back. I can wear heels, which doesn't sound like a big deal to most people, but is super exciting to me for somebody who at 28 had to walk in orthopedic shoes and I don't wear stilettos, but you know, I can wear cute shoes and I can go hiking and um, I, I don't have stamina like an athlete does, but um, I can exercise for an hour. That's a huge thing for me. And um, I had to start at five minutes and I, I went back to graduate school. I got two graduate degrees. I started this busy practice. I run this practice. I work a little too much and I'm working on that, but I can do it. And I feel vibrant. I don't feel like that person from 15 years ago. And even telling the story, I feel like I'm talking about this other life. It's not the life that I relate to today. I do have a lot of health maintenance. So it's not like I'm out there eating Pizza Hut and McDonald's. I eat very, very clean. I take my supplements. I exercise, I do my castor oil packs, I do my sauna, I do all the things regularly that take good care of me. But you can recover. And I was one of those cases that practitioners didn't think I would come back from. And I was told I would be in a wheelchair by the time I was in my 30s that um, I could expect to have really poor quality of life. And that road that I was going down, that's that's what was to be expected. But fortunately, we know all kinds of things we didn't know 15, 20 years ago. And I see very similar cases. People recover within three or four years. They don't take the 15, 20 years that it took me or the you know hundreds of thousands of dollars it took me. So that's the, the light at the end of the tunnel that I want to share. Thank you so much for sharing that story. You've been through a lot, but it's great that you're doing a lot better. And, and like you said, you need to maintain your health. You can't just go out and eat anything. And I'm sure stress management is important. So, you know, diet and lifestyle is huge, really with any chronic health condition. But 
One thing I want to ask, so most listening to this have a thyroid or autoimmune thyroid condition, and there are certain symptoms associated with hyperthyroidism as well as hypothyroidism. Some of them more classic, some of them not as common. So with mast cell activation syndrome, are there classic symptoms associated with it, or does it really vary depending on the person? Yeah, great question. And maybe we should start just because this may be brand new for some people, just what are mast cells? to begin with, I like to think of these as our frontline defending and sensing cells of the immune system. They're out there, they're, they're in almost every tissue in the body. The only tissue I've ever seen documented that's up to date is the retina doesn't have mast cells. I used to think the brain didn't have mast cells, but that's been um, disproven in the last few years. And we even have mast cells inside the brain. And they're sensing Every molecule of air, every molecule of food, water, supplement, medication, anything you put in your mouth, um, anything that we smell, that we touch, they're sensing stressors, and that's that role of chronic stress. And they're also sensing what's happening inside our bodies. So they line the blood vessels. They're sensing the blood that's going through the vessels. They sense they have hormone receptors for things like estrogen, progesterone, and thyroid hormones, and the thyroid tissue has mast cells as well. So they have over 200 different types of receptors, and they're some of the most complex cells in the body. They're also sensing for pathogens, viruses, bacteria, parasites, molds, yeasts. Um, there's all kinds of sensors for different types of medications, even vitamin D, so which is actually a hormone, but lots of things and neurotransmitters. This is really important. They have receptors for many different types of neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. Then they have over a thousand different mediators housed inside of them that they can release. And most people are familiar with histamine and they do, they're one of the major cells that release histamine. There's a couple other in the body, but then over a thousand different ones. So prostaglandins, cytokines now a household name they release cytokines we could go down the list but cell signalers and what they do is they mobilize an immune response if it's needed for example if you cut your finger you don't get the bacteria cleaned out it starts to get red and puffy that's the mast cells creating some local inflammation as a protective mechanism if we get a surgery we get a little local inflammation around that surgical site part of that's the mast cells protecting us um, if we get sick, and most people know now, but but some people may not realize that when we get sick and we get the sinus congestion and the sore throat, that's not the virus itself. That's our immune system launching a protective attack. So they should be doing this normal protective response and then restabilizing. So they're releasing these inflammatory mediators to protect us and then restabilizing themselves. In mast cell activation syndrome, the mast cells have become dysregulated for a variety of reasons, but really it boils down to an overload of pathogens, toxins, stressors, and stressors could be emotional trauma, they could be injuries or so on. Surgery sometimes can trigger this dysregulation. Any combo of those. And it's like the mast cells, instead of being security guards, or I think of the guards of the castle gate, they, they're on an eight hour shift, they do their work, they protect you, but they get to take a break and recharge. Just like as human beings, if we work security duty, we would need to take a break and recharge. But we live in a world now that is, we're onslaught of these chemicals, EMFs, molds have become epidemic, all this stuff coming us all this, so much that we didn't have 150 years ago, 1500 years ago, 15,000 years ago. So our mast cells haven't caught up to this rapid change in the world that we live in, even the level of stress that we have, just getting the kids to all the extracurriculars and getting through traffic and trying to pay the bills and coming out of this pandemic, all the stuff that we just deal with day in and day out, the, the war in Ukraine. I mean, it's just the, the amount of stress that we're all under day to day is astronomical compared to what we used to have. So now the mast cells, instead of getting to do their protective job and relax, they're on guard 24 seven. And just like if we were on guard 24 seven, we would lose our ability to think clearly, they start to lose their fine tuning. 
instead of just firing at pathogens, at toxins, now they're firing at what I think of as like butterflies. And we can start to have increased inflammation for all kinds of reasons and things we may not even think about as being triggering. Some people get food triggers, not all, but some. Um, some people get triggered by the perfume somebody's wearing in the in um, the grocery store. They get triggered by the fragrance and the laundry detergent, the fragrance aisle, by molds and so on. So these mast cells can become hypersensitive and over-responsive. Here's the real important information about this is that mast cell activation syndrome is now affecting between 9 to 17 percent of the general population. Wow. It's huge. That's at least one in nine. We're talking closer to probably one in seven people dealing with this. And people have no idea. It's one of the most under-recognized, under-addressed conditions. So how do you know if you have this? And there's going to be inflammatory symptoms in two or more systems. So system, of course, being like the skin or the GI tract, um, the thyroid, can be the bladder, the reproductive organs, can be the muscles, the bones, the nervous system and the brain, anything like this. And that's what makes figuring out who has this tricky. You need to have other things ruled out, make sure that there's not a cancer, inflammatory bowel disorder, those types of things, but these are actually all linked to mast cells. Because if there's inflammation, there's some mast cell involvement. Symptoms can vary greatly. So just to circle back to that first question, symptoms can really vary because it depends on which mast cells are activated in what tissues, which of these thousand mediators are being over-released and which receptors are overly sensitive. So if we think about the number of possible combinations there, it's almost, almost impossible to calculate. Some examples Classic examples are stereotypical examples where people that have skin symptoms like hives, rashes, flushing, allergy kind of symptoms. Not, we're not talking seasonal allergies, though. That's something that just is there for short term with, say, pollen, and then it's gone. This is going to be year-round. It may wax and wane, but it's not like you just have it in the spring and fall, and then you're fine. And it's got to be multiple systems. Some people get anaphylaxis reactions or anaphylactoid reactions. And those are the really frightening, my throat's closing, my chest is tightening, I feel like I'm going to pass out or I do pass out, blood pressure drops. But you don't have to have those to have mast cell activation syndrome. And not everybody gets skin symptoms. So that's some misinformation that's out there that if you don't have hives, you don't have mast cell activation. That's not true. So some other presentations can be GI issues, it can be acid reflux, it can be um, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, like the visceral hypersensitivity kind of pain. It can be lung issues with uh, congestion, asthma, chest tightening, these types of things. We can have sinus-related symptoms and post-nasal drip. We can have red, inflamed, eyes, itchy eyes. We can have issues with urinary burning and pain. We can have, for women, menstrual difficulties have been related. Muscle pain, joint pain, fibromyalgia type pain. Hypermobility is really linked and POTS is common. Pustural orthostatic um, tachycardia syndrome. This is where we get these blood pressure changes that are rapid with sitting, standing, and because there's so many symptoms, it would take, we could spend the whole time just doing the symptoms. Um, I did put together a symptom survey people can find. It's free on our website. It's just at mastcell360.com. They go under MCAS. This is symptom survey. And I'll, it's I'll, I'll make sure to include it in the, in the show notes as well. Thank you. And that's based on the symptoms been clearly correlated in the research. The more symptoms you have, the more likely you have mast cell activation syndrome. So you can just count them. Autoimmunity, every form of autoimmunity that's been studied in relationship to mast cell activation syndrome has been linked to the mast cells. So that's going to include Hashimoto's, it's going to include Graves, things like rheumatoid 
the autoimmune GI symptoms, skin eczema, psoriasis, all these types of things. The reason is mast cells sit at this interface of the immune system, and they have a role in fighting off pathogens. And then they also are really involved in what's called this TH2 side of the immune system. When our pathogen killing side gets overwhelmed and this chronic inflammation side comes up and those of course work like a seesaw. When you have this elevated TH2 for a long time, certain predispositions can open us up towards autoimmunity branching off of that, that TH17 response. So you may not develop autoimmunity. And as far as I know, I've not had any autoimmunity, fortunately, but there's a huge number of people with mass activation syndrome that do have autoimmunity. So if you have autoimmunity, that's a dead ringer, go check for mass activation syndrome. So I know that was a long answer, but hopefully that hit it what you were asking. Yeah, no, you gave a lot of great information and answered some of the questions I had for you. I guess with the prevalence, did you say nine to 17% is what the prevalence of uh, mast cell activation syndrome? That's what the population studies have shown. And, and I assume it's increasing just because of like some of the factors you mentioned earlier, like just the increased toxic burden, the molds, pretty much all the things you mentioned earlier. We do think that it's definitely on the rise. And even just looking at case presentations from decades ago, beyond just the increased understanding. And when I talk to people who've been in practice for 40, 50 years, and Dr. Neil Nathan's one of my um, mentors and a friend of mine, so he's been in practice for 40 years. He talks about noticing that the cases have gotten more complex, more challenging. Have you noticed that in your practice? I have. I definitely have over, I've been doing this now for about 12 years. And I would say that I think with any practitioner, also the more experience they get, then the more complex patients they see as well because of that experience. Uh, so I think it's a combination, but I, but I agree. Just uh, I, I would definitely say over the years that I'm seeing more complex patients than compared to 10, 12 years ago. And what I'm finding is that what worked 10 years ago isn't working today. So we know that something's shifting. When I had somebody come in with candida issues, I could work with herbals for them 10 years ago. It was pretty easy. They'd be cleared up in three to six months, boom, and then they were happy. It's just, it, it's not knocking it out. So even those organisms are changing with what's happening in our environment. Fortunately, we've got the knowledge to address it. We need a lot more practitioners who are gonna work in this space. But yeah, we, we have some, some trouble that we're in around what's happened environmentally. When it comes to like multiple chemical sensitivities, so is mast cell activation linked to that as well, or is it a potential cause? Yeah, so there was a great study that came out. I know that Tanya Dempsey was a co-author on that study and they called it TILT, toxicant induced, I'm forgetting the acronym, but Yes, there is. That study definitively showed a role of mast cells in chemical intolerances, which makes a lot of sense because these mast cells are, are sensing everything that's happening chemical wise, whether it's, you know, we're getting it through skin products that have parabens or it's, it's again, that Glade plug-in or something like that, and then releasing inflammation, they're also, they line every nerve ending and the nerve sheaths. So the mast cells are interwoven really with the nervous system. So that's why I said it was really important that mast cells have receptors for neurotransmitters. They also can release certain neurotransmitters and the nerve endings have receptors for some of these mast cell mediators. So there's this constant crosstalk and that's why when we start to get into mast cell activation, if we have a flare or they're getting triggered and they're getting activated, we can get all these nervous system systems with it, heart palpitations, throat closing that's being triggered from the nervous system signaling. And that's why we can get reactions within fractions of seconds. So when people say, I, as soon as my husband starts cooking something, you know, that triggers them, let's say it's, I don't know what, it starts grilling and you smell that grilling smell. Somebody who that's a trigger for them may literally start to have reactions before they register the smell. 
because the limbic system's already registered it, there's mast cells in the limbic system, then it's sending a danger signal through the body. And this is where people have been told often that they're crazy because we didn't, they used to think that immune cells could react that rapidly, but it's through that nervous system signaling that it's happening. You mentioned the connection or at least an overlap between mast cell activation and different autoimmune conditions. So not everybody with mast cell activation syndrome develops autoimmunity. Like you said, you, you as far as you know, don't have an autoimmune condition. But just so I could better understand, some of the same triggers of mast cell activation could also affect autoimmunity. I know what autoimmunity, food, stress, chemicals, infections... So again, that's where that overlap comes in between the mast cell activation and the autoimmune. And you also mentioned, I know, the shift in the immune system, the TH2 dominant condition. It is. It's it's interesting. We looked at all these chronic types of conditions, the autoimmunity, the mast cell activation, even things like cancers, bowel disorders, neurodegenerative diseases. These are all coming. We just keep trickling down to the same root causes. And they're pathogens, toxins. And, um, and in pathogens, I'm going to include mold and toxins, and we include mold toxins, um, but that can also be chemical toxins, metals, these kinds of things, and stressors. And we underestimate the role of chronic stress, but this huge the model that I found that describes that best is that cell danger response model developed by Robert Navio, who looks at when we have an overload of these events, then the body is going to go into protective survival mode. And that's the expression of that. It's going to look different person to person, depending on their unique biology. So for some people, that's mass activation syndrome with autoimmunity. For some people, that's going to be neurodegeneration and it's going to be cancer. But we can pull it all back to this similar root problem and then how's it being expressed? Just in terms of these triggers though, for example, like food, um, certain smells, and, and they're variable from person to person. Some people have histamine intolerance, some people have trouble with salicylates, oxalates, lectins. Lectins are really big in autoimmunity. Oxalates are a big deal in the thyroid. They can lodge in the thyroid, and there's studies that show that they can disrupt the thyroid functioning. That a lot of times that's where the biochemistry is getting disrupted by something underneath. So then again, we peel back to why. And if we can address that why, many times the expression and, and the sensitivities will improve. So I used to be so incredibly sensitive. I couldn't, if somebody was already on an elevator, I couldn't go in because I couldn't take the risk that they were wearing any kind of fragrance. I might pass out in the, in the, elevator. And I don't want to pass out in an elevator with a stranger. <laughs> and, and I couldn't take an Uber uh, or a taxi before there was Uber, a taxi, because they would have those little fragrance things. When I couldn't walk and it was like being on ground glass, that was oxalates, I realized over time. Mm -hmm. And I, but I can tolerate a much wider variety of oxalates now. I don't eat the big ones. I don't eat beets, sweet potatoes and almonds or chard now, or spinach. But um, I can eat all kinds of foods that I couldn't eat before with addressing that mold toxicity, the lime layers, the load is off of my body. And we see that a lot in autoimmunity as well, if we settle it down. Now, people may be a little more, they may need to be careful with things like lectins long term, because those are a little different case in terms of activating. There's lectin receptors on mast cells. So it's part of that link. I also read somewhere where it was a journal article where mast cells potentially can decrease regulatory T cells and the regulatory T cells keep autoimmunity in check. So I guess that's another potential mechanism, at least making someone more susceptible to an autoimmune condition. Yeah. And it's through this cytokine network. So the, all of these various types, so many types, and there's inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines and all the signaling. And, and that level is beyond what I understand right now, this, you know, uh, serious immu immunologist kind of level, but they're communicating the B cells, the T cells, every kind of immune cell there is. I think of the mast cells being one of the big conductors and orchestrators of the immune system, and they're keeping everybody in check. And they're not the only cell doing that, but they have a big role to play. 
And so if your conductor gets out of sync, the whole orchestra is going to be out of sync and start to get dysregulated too. Are there any other connections, any other links you know of between thyroid health and mast cell activation syndrome? Well, one of the biggest ones is uh, mold toxins. And this is something that was a game changer in my practice in terms of really jettisoning the successes that we got was realizing how common this is. And many people are underestimating the impact of mold on their chronic illness because either they get a urine test back and it shows low levels and they don't realize those are fat soluble. So almost everybody has low levels on the first test Um, or they only get one test and it looks negative. So they don't go any further. They only get one test from one company. But mold toxins have a huge effect on the thyroid. And I do more frequently see hypothyroid. I also, as much as the thyroid needs iodine, in the mold toxicity population, I see iodine supplementation until that mold layer is addressed can tip people into hyperthyroid. And I did that to myself. So I know I mentioned before that I'd had hyperthyroid. I was trying to get just a little bit of iodine in. And then all of a sudden couldn't figure out why um, I'm not old enough to have perimenopause or I'm not ready yet. (laughs) I think I'm not ready yet. Anyway, I started having these flushes, like these heat flushes and I was sweating and I'm somebody who used to didn't, when this happened, I didn't sweat. I hadn't completely regained my ability to sweat. And all of a sudden I'm like sweating in December and I run cold all the time and I like it to be 78 degrees and I'm hitting that air conditioner down to 70 and my husband's cold and he's usually, he's the Canadian, so he's usually hot. So we do have to be careful with that. I don't know the exact mechanism of why, but I just find that people are tend to be more sensitive to iodine, but it, it has a real disrupting effect on the thyroid function itself. It has a disrupting effect on the thyroid hormones. So we often will, will see that hyper, hypothyroid state and that Hashimoto state. It usually gets better when I find, I'm sure you find too, gluten being a big role with those proteins being similar to the thyroid and getting the mold toxins out. A lot of times people who just can't get those Hashimoto's antibodies under check, they get the mold toxins addressed. They'll usually drop down pretty well if other triggers are handled. Now, not if somebody's still eating gluten and those types of things, but. A lot of people who have mold also have Lyme. And if someone has, let's say, mold and Lyme and or co-infections like Bartonella, would you prioritize the, the molds? Uh, I would imagine you want to, the first probably priority is trying to get rid of the source of the molds. Yes. And that that's often a game changer for people who've had cases like mine who just haven't tolerated Lyme treatment or have treated Lyme for years and years and years and they still have symptoms, there's often this missing mold layer. So if somebody has acute Lyme and they were just bitten by a tick last month and they've got the fevers and um, they're trying to fight off the infection, that's a different story. But looking at people who've had chronic Lyme for years like I did, if there's that mold layer, I find that it's much better to peel back the mold layer first for a few reasons. Lyme and mold have very similar symptoms. And when I say Lyme, I'm using that term really loosely for tick-borne infections. And particularly Bartonella can look like Lyme. In both some classic symptoms, not everybody gets this, but lightning bolt pains or these shooting pains that move around and uh, tinnitus really common in those. And one of the just most challenging symptoms in, in those, but if you clear the mold layer, about 30 to 40 percent of cases, at least that I see, can spontaneously clear the Lyme. Their body's immune system kicks in. And that happened for me as I worked on these other layers. My Lyme symptoms went away and they're non-existent. I never tolerated the antibiotics or the stronger herbals. But about 60, 70 percent of people do have to go on and address that Lyme or t- other tick-borne infection layer, they tolerate the treatment so much better because you've gotten this massive toxin load out. 
And then as you're killing these pathogens off, the body's not trying to clear all those mold toxins with those biotoxins. The immune system's in better balance. So uh, mold toxins are huge immune dysregulators. And we just don't really give mold toxins the kind of credit that they deserve in terms of how toxic they are. But to put it in a context for people, I know you know this, but for, for the listeners, um, they use these mold toxins for chemical warfare. And mycophenolic acid is used as a chemotherapy drug. And it's one of the most toxic of the chemotherapy drugs. They're highly carcinogenic. They disrupt every system in the body. The zeroalanone is extremely estrogenic. It's numerous times more powerful than our body's own estrogen. Lots of reproductive issues associated with that, reproductive cancers, endometriosis, PCOS. So we need to be looking at this and, and taking it seriously. Neurodegenerative illnesses, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's linked to it. It's a big, big deal. You mentioned that histamine is just one of many mediators uh, released by mass, stored and released by mast cells. So can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance and how someone can know if they just have histamine intolerance or if they have mast cell activation? Yeah, and the symptoms can be similar because histamine, well, well, first histamine intolerance, we're just talking about histamine. So out of any, of the, we're not talking about tryptase or any of these other leukotrienes or any of these other mediators. Histamine intolerance happens when the histamine in our bodies exceeds the capacity of the enzymes that break it down to break it down and remove it. And the major enzymes we talk about are DAO, HNMT, which is dependent on methylation. So some of our more savvy listeners probably found that out. There are actually all these other enzymes that are rarely talked about related to it. ALDH, which also breaks down alcohol. So a lot of times people with histamine intolerance have trouble with alcohol as well if that pathway is affected. Um, acetylation, there's liver pathways, there's a glucuronidation pathway involved and so on. DAO is, a, is one of the big ones and it's made primarily in the small intestine. So you can have genetic issues that can impact that. But if you have any kind of gut inflammation there, that's going to affect those small intestinal brush border cells and being able to make it as well. Or if you have nutrient depletions in the important um, nutrients that are involved. So if we can't break it down, I like to think of it like a sink and the histamine that's coming into our bodies through our foods or the histamine that's being triggered and being released by the mast cells the eosinophils, the basophils, that's like the water coming out of the, the faucet. And then these enzymes are like the drain. So if we have water pouring into the sink and the drain is clear and open and it's large enough for the water flow, we'll just, the sink will just keep draining and we're fine. But if that water coming in exceeds the capacity of the drain or the drain gets clogged and gets smaller and smaller, the sink's gonna overflow. And that's when we get those symptoms. They can be similar because the histamine is triggering the mast cells. So the mast cells have four different types of histamine receptors. And we can get GI symptoms, acid reflux, diarrhea is more common than constipation, but you could go that direction. Flushing, people are familiar with flushing after like red wine. I used to, when I really started getting into nutrition, I got into the Weston e. Price work, which is wonderful work that I'm a 150% kind of person, which means I overdo everything. And my kitchen looked like a laboratory and I had all my, my kefirs and my cultured veggies and my kombucha and my raw milk and all this stuff. But it's all really high histamine. And I couldn't figure out why I was itching head to toe 24 seven, waking up at night, scratching my skin till it bled. And then realized, oh, <laughs> I'm overdoing the histamine. Okay, let's dial this back. But other foods like walnuts, spinach, cashews, peanuts, strawberries, pineapple, um, we've got a really thorough list on our website. And I want to caution people to it, use a really well-researched list. Dr. Janaja, um, Janice Janaja's work is really good. There's a SIGI list, S-I-G-H-I. But a lot of lists online are just copied from other lists and they make mistakes in the copying and about 95% of them out there have errors. So make sure you use a good list. But it, so that's the histamine intolerance. 
the symptoms are usually, if that's all somebody has, they don't have mast cell activation syndrome, the symptoms are usually much milder. With mast cell activation syndrome, the symptoms are going to be more varied, more complex, and more intense. Now, somebody could have mast cell activation syndrome and not have histamine intolerance. They may have issues with the other mediators, and they don't have problems with histamine. So I have had some people come through who did a low histamine diet trial for six weeks. I usually ask people to do low histamine and low lectin for six weeks, see if you get a symptom improvement, and then introduce some high histamine foods and see if you get an increase in symptoms. That's the way that one of the easy ways to determine. You add in some DAO supplementation and uh, methylation supports are too tricky in this population. So I don't do them early in. You've got to get, that's usually about two years into a program. But if we get big improvements, okay, histamine intolerance is on the table. I don't get people, very many people just have histamine intolerance. I've had a few, but I'm overkill for that. So I don't see many of those people. They've usually figured that out on their own and, and they're much better just doing those steps and, and they're good to go. The, you still want to go, well, why? You know, why weren't you making DAO? Things like that. But the mass activation syndrome, I've had just a handful of people who only have MCAS and they don't have histamine intolerance. Most of my clients have both. And they find that they do get some symptom relief, reducing the histamines and supporting that DAO and the other histamine degrading pathways and what's affecting them. But it doesn't clear it up. It's not going to do enough. And that's what I found my myself. I followed a low histamine diet for about two years thinking, oh, I found the holy grail before I knew about mast cell activation. This is going to handle all my symptoms. And it brought it down a good 20% for me. Um, and it's still a fairly important, but you can recover with that too. I can eat. I, I used to be very limited in the foods I could tolerate. And now I can have, as long as I don't overdo it, I can have about 10 strawberries now. And I take my DAO and I'm pretty good to go. So I'm excited to say that came from having 10 foods I tolerated. Do you do testing? Well, I know you do genetic testing, correct? For like DAO and, and of course it looks at a lot of other things. And do you test for histamine or any other testing related to histamine intolerance or mast cell activation syndrome? There is a test through Precision Point Diagnostics for DAO and histamine. And um, it's a good test. It's not one consumers can get on their own. So I don't often talk about it because of that, but um, they could obviously get it through you. And I think that that's a, a fairly good test. It's not 100%. And if somebody's on antihistamines, the histamine may look lower than it would otherwise. I, in terms of the other types of mast cell mediator test, I don't ask people to get it because one, I'm a consulting practice, I don't diagnose, so I, I don't need it. But two, the problem with those tests, the, the histamine, the leukotrienes, the prostaglandin tests, and so on, they to be accurate, they have to be kept chilled from the time of collection all the way through the processing, including the centrifuge has to be chilled. If not, it's likely to be show negative. And these mediators are up and down the bloodstream very rapidly. So I've known practitioners who had to get that positive mast cell mediator result for insurance coverage for a patient. And they had them trigger a flare, which is always really hard on people. And then have them come in and sit in the office for eight hours and draw their blood every hour on the hour, hoping to catch that spike. So that's, it's a... Um, there's still a lot of challenges in that testing. There are people like Dr. Afrin who have access to the cold centrifuge labs and, and can get those samples handled properly, but it's, it's hard to do. What are some of the, if you were to give some action steps to where people could heal from mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance? Yeah, I'd love to. The absolute first thing I tell people to do is, so I have different phases we work through. First phase is stabilizing. And stabilizing means that we're going to identify and lower triggers. And so if that means um, if we haven't done a clean out the cleaning product kind of thing, uh, cleaning product detox, we're gonna do that. Make sure that we're not using bleach, we're not using some of these bigger trigger items. 
clean out our personal care products, make sure that the diet's clean. And most of the people that come in to work with me have already done a lot of work on this. So I'm not usually starting with gluten or sugar or dairy, but working on those things, working on processed foods and mold exposure is huge. Most people think they have no mold in their home. It's rare for me to work with somebody who doesn't have mold in their home once we look for it. And many times people brought inspectors in to check and they told them there's no mold issue. And then I say, well, they only ran an air sample test, which is the least sensitive test. And they're comparing your spores of mold outside to inside. That makes no sense because if you have, as an analogy, there's a million cockroaches outside there's 2,000 cockroaches in your house. You're still not going to be happy with 2,000 cockroaches in your house. Um, the same with the mold. We can't be mold-free, but we need to be out of the toxic molds, the ones that are triggering to mast cells. The non-toxic ones, unless somebody has mold allergy, aren't as, as concerning. Um, but it's hard to find a good mediator or remediator and inspector who, who really understands this level of sensitivity to mold. And stabilizing also includes, so, so that's kind of the trigger management side. In addition, stress, you talked about stress management before, and toxic relationships. People don't realize if you're in a toxic relationship or somebody's abusive, um, that's going to keep your body in a fight or flight state as well. Then we work on nervous system support, and that's a very specific limbic system work and vagal system work. And both of those systems have to be worked on simultaneously. We can't just do one or the other. And these are much more refined than a YouTube meditation. Those are great and absolutely keep doing them, but we're talking about real specific practices here. Uh, and then mast cell stabilizing supplements. So some of my favorite starting points, if somebody's not super sensitive, and I think, is your audience really sensitive? A small percentage. I would say the majority aren't. So people who aren't sensitive, I put my, my clients into three groups. So I'll start with the easy category. I don't get many of those, but people who are in that easy category, they could take some of the combo products that are out there that are mast cell supporting supplements. They usually contain quercetin. Um, they might be able to handle some things like bromelain or stinging nettle. Sensitive people usually have a little more trouble with those, but those can work. I love the quercetin perilla seed extract, bakelin, Chinese skullcap extract, some of my top go-tos. Vitamin D is huge for mast cell stabilizing. And being well hydrated actually is uh, antihistamine. So being well hydrated is important. For people that are, we more, mostly work with what I call our sensitive complex population and then our super sensitive people who are struggling with any supplements or medications. Sometimes we'll just start people with micro dosing and we'll take a tiny, just a few granules in water, stir it and take a couple sips and that's it for the day. So that entry can be helpful for really sensitive people. And um, sometimes when people are super sensitive, I'll start them with little sprinkles of baking soda. Baking soda is actually mass stabilizing. And many people may have found that it calms down a flare for them if they do a quarter to half a teaspoon of baking soda. Now, if there's high blood pressure, that may not be the right thing for you, or somebody has extremely low stomach acid, sometimes that can make their stomach feel bad. But most people can do, even really resensitive people usually can do a little baking soda. So that's their starting point. Then we're looking all through that, we're looking at what are major underlying issues, what's the root causes. And like we talked about before, if mold is there, I almost always find it if I dig enough and we look at the right panels for people. And again, I find people, some people are looking at panels that are missing it for them. But then we're gonna start on that mold layer. We've gotta bring the symptoms down a few notches. That's why we're gonna stabilize first. Because once we start detoxing, we're gonna have these kind of swings and symptoms up and down. So if somebody's way at the top of what they can handle, I don't wanna flare them anymore. I don't want them feeling worse. We're gonna come down to here. And we'll start with some precision targeted binders, going to some liver lump supports. Elimination's key. We've got to address the constipation before you do any binders. Then if people are colonized, that antifungal layer. So that kind of lays it out, a uh, big picture framework. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And that's why it takes, you said, in, in most of your patients, you said most of the people you see, it takes a few years to get them to the point where you are now, correct? On the really short end for adults, we're usually looking at about a year and a half if they're not too complex and they had some short mold exposures. Um, most people are looking between about two to four years. If they're really severe like I was, and I had, when I looked back, about 30 years of mold exposures, um, just from place to place to place to place. And then that can take about five to six years. But generally people are getting, vast majority of people are getting improvements as they go along. There is a very small percentage of people that may not feel better until they get all of the mold out of their system and the Lyme treated. That's the hardest case to stay for the client to stay persistent with. It takes a lot of patience and a lot of trust and faith that this is going to lead them somewhere. And that, that persistence is key. This is hard work. I know your audience knows that. There aren't any, here, take these two supplements and you'll be done soon. Yeah, well, the, the big thing is that there's hope. So regardless of how complex the condition, and again, it sounds like, you know, you are, you know, on the highest spectrum of complex conditions. And again, you're doing a lot better. So yeah, it's it's great that you're giving hope to, to the listeners with complex conditions. Beth, where could people learn more about you? I know your, your website is masscell360.com. You mentioned a few lists, I believe, which I'll list in the show notes, but can you repeat some of the resources? Absolutely. So we've got a symptom survey on the website. We have our foods lists. If people are looking at histamine, they want a salicylates histamine list, a lectin histamine list, oxalate histamine list. We've got those up there. And then we've also got a Facebook group and a nice community there. People are welcome. Um, they can do both groups. And I think they complement each other really nicely. Um, and we have courses that get people started. So on the stabilization steps, the nervous system and the mast cell supporting supplements. And then we have a, what I call my MC360 precision mold masterclass. That helps people get going on their mold journey. They may need a practitioner some point along the way because that, you know how complex that is and it needs to really be individualized, but it helps people make choices and get going. Well, thank you. Thank you again so much for, uh, for doing this, for getting together. Uh, I'm sure the listeners learned a lot about mast cell activation syndrome, histamine intolerance, and please do visit Beth's website, masscell360.com. Sounds like there's some wonderful resources on there. And again, thank you so much, Beth. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate you having me on and all the work that you do as well. We can help people get better faster.